Mm. I'm into the full trilogy. Alright, so if this goes well, I will use, also use this as a submission video for AGDQ 2018. So, with that in mind, I'm Rico, and this is an AGDQ 2018 submission for Crash Bandicoot and Insane Trilogy. Full Trilogy any percent. So, Full Trilogy any percent is a category that is a combination of all three any percents. So essentially you beat Crash 1, Crash 2, and Crash 3 all like in order in succession. So a lot of this is just going to be restating stuff I mentioned in my separate submissions for each of the categories individually. So we start with Crash 1, and the movement in Crash 1 is far more basic than the later games in the series. Crash only really has access to running, jumping, and spinning. So a lot of the time save comes from either invincibility right here. So the mask that's following me is Aku Aku, and you get him whenever you break crates with his face on him. And if you he protects you from hits, so he'll protect you once if you have one of him. If you have two of them, he'll protect you twice. If you get him three times, then you go invincible and he attaches to your face like you did here. And that gives you a pretty significant speed boost. So it's extremely useful to go for invincibility as much as you can. The other thing you do is that at the end of the, uh, every level, there is a screen that I just passed where it says, great, but you missed this many boxes. And for every box you missed in the level, they'll fall on Crash's head. So despite this being any percent, you want to break as many crates as you can just to make that screen shorter. And you can you can speed up the animation by holding X, but overall you still want to go for as many crates as you can because each crate is about a sixth of a second on the ending screen. So, yeah. This is Jungle Rollers. I will be using invincibility twice in this level. So I'm actually going to wait a little bit here, because if I am already invincible and I break another mask crate, then the invincibility doesn't reset and I just lose access to that mask. So, And it is better to just wait on that last invincibility for a couple seconds than it is to just skip it. Because Crash 1 is a more basic game than Crash 2 and Crash 3, a lot of the optimization is just getting invincibility in the right spots, cutting corners where you can, skipping through cycles, and just a bunch of stuff like that. So this level is the Great Gate, and... Invincibility will be extremely useful in this level, particularly in the second portion, because it will allow me to run through a bunch of obstacles that I would otherwise have to wait on. One thing of note is that invincibility doesn't boost your movement speed while you're on the air. It only boosts your ground-based movement, so with invincibility you want to stay as grounded as much as you can. So yeah, thanks to the invincibility I can just run straight through all of those spikes. And you actually gain enough speed that you can just run through, run over these holes. Although that last one's a little finicky. For a reason, that spike is nearly impossible to get over. So.
next level is boulders. This is one of the two chase levels in the game. And this will be the only level where we will break every single crate. Because if you break every crate and then you skip the gem at the end of the level, you get the shortest possible ending screen where it'll just say nearly perfect but you missed the gem. And gems are the reward you get for breaking every box in a level. So they're required for the other like completion categories such as 105% and all gems, but they're not necessary for any percent aside from one, which I'll get to later. So. So breaking every box in this level gives you the short end screen where no boxes fall and crash his head, but he also doesn't collect the gem. And it results in the end screen being very short, so you would think it would be useful in a lot more levels than just this one. However, it's never worth going off of the path to break boxes, and every other level has boxes somewhere that are out of the way, or they're in bonus rounds. Which, in the original Crash 1, bonus rounds weren't required for completion to get gems. When they did the Unseen Trilogy, they changed a lot of Crash 1's mechanics to make it more consistent with Crash 2 and 3, and that included making the bonus rounds necessary. So a lot of levels you just miss boxes on the fact that you go through bonus rounds now. And then there's only one other level where you can get all the boxes in one passing without detouring, and it is not beneficial in that level because as far as we know there's currently not a way to skip the gem. So this is upstream. I'm gonna do a bit of a cycle skip right here. So if you go moving immediately and line yourself up to the right the moment you spawn in the level you can actually catch that leaf cycle and that's why I skipped the box that was to the left because I had to line myself up properly. One thing to note is that boulders took both of my masks away from me so I'm currently maskless. Also, hey White Paws and hey Otzi, thank you for the good luck. Uh, the reason I'm commentating is because if this full trilogy run goes well, I'll use it for my submission video for AGDQ, so. If I'm more talkative than normal, that's why. <laughs> cycle skip without double jump. It's a little, it's a baby cycle skip, it saves a couple seconds. But it's not like... It's not double jumped here from the original Crash 1. Because they built the Insane Trilogy from the ground up, it didn't use any original programming. A lot of tricks from the original Crash games, or a lot of glitch movement, it didn't carry over. So. The most notable loss in Crash 1 was zigzagging, which was a technique where you'd alternate on diagonals instead of just moving straight forward and you would go a little faster and the end scene trilogy it actually slows you down so this is the first boss fight this is papu papu he's very easy you just jump on his head five times and yeah <laughs> so they actually removed the invincibility frames on papu papu in this fight so you can just jump on his head immediately And then after you knock him out and he lands on the ground, you can actually stand in the center of him. So when you beat him, Crash does this thing where he bounces on his belly out of the hut. And just when you're like centered inside Papu's belly, that's about as close. That's the closest you can get to him. And it just speeds up the cutscene. A uh, uh, nice thing of note is that they actually gave Papu, Papu five hit points in this game. In the original Crash 1, he only had three, but that's actually something they carried over from the Japanese version of Crash 1. In the Japanese version of the original game, Papu Papu had five hit points, assumedly to make him more challenging. Still not a very difficult boss, though. So this is Rolling Stones. This level is a little tricky to, to do quickly because there's a lot of rolling uh, disc obstacles that you have to dodge. But if all goes well, I'll get invincibility twice in this level, which makes things much easier to manage. So... I missed a boxer that I was trying to hit. It's never worth going back for a box if you miss it, just because 
it would waste more time to go for it. Oh, that's unfortunate. I'll just do this. It's not how I meant to do it. I was supposed to spin the plant into the mask, but this works too, I guess. World record attempts. Hey, Joester. I mean, I think I'm like what three minutes behind world record, and I have seven minutes to save in this in this game alone. Crash one, so I think my chances are decent. It has been a while since I did a full trilogy. I've been focusing on each game individually. So this is hog wild. In this level you ride a hog and it you automatically move forward so you just move left and right to dodge obstacles. It's kind of an auto scroller and kind of not in the sense that you can go faster by constantly jumping but it messes up a cycle at the end which is already notoriously difficult to jump over. So currently we don't know a way to like make it better to constantly jump as far as we know. That could change. But this is the level where I'm going to break all but one crate, and it's because I can't actually skip the gem in this level, as like we haven't at least haven't found a way to do it. And collecting the gem is much slower than just leaving one box. So, okay, there we go. So I left the last box because I found that last hog. Its hitbox is very annoying, and a lot of newcomers and even some seasoned veterans ha have been having trouble with that jump. I found that I get it more consistently when I jump through the center of the hog. So I use that last box to just line myself up to the center, and then that's also just the box I skip. Do I still do green gem in this, or is it not worth it with the bonus? Um, yes, that's actually a good point, Joe. You do the green gem. However, there's a backup if you die in the level. Which I'll, I'll explain more when I get to Lost City, since I'm using this as a submission vid for AGDQ. So this is Native Fortress. This level... This level's infamous for being really annoying to do fast. It's very cycle heavy, and sometimes if the cycles desync or you get slowed down somewhere, your entire timing can be thrown off, and you can lose a lot of time in this level just for getting slowed down. So those fires actually have a very deceptive hitbox. They go much higher than they than the animation implies. So you can like jump over the fire and it would still hit you. But it also doesn't last as long as the animation makes it seem like it does. I'm gonna damage boost here, which lets me go through that TNT without harming myself, which saves time over destroying that entire stack. And then I'm gonna grab this mask because it'll be useful very much later on, like a couple levels down the front line. That's the neat thing about masks in this game is because the invincibility is so useful, uh, mask planning can be done like levels ahead. So, 
What do I know? You can also do a spin bounce on these torches and you don't bounce off of them, which just saves time in the air. Oh, game dropped my spin there. Yeah, so this mask, ideally, I'll keep, I'll hold on to it all the way into the third level of the second island. Spin bounce is also very helpful there because it means you don't have to do a thing where you can go into the background and that's how you're supposed to dodge those torches. Oh, I'm just missing all of these, aren't I? <laughs> Castle does have some really neat strats in the Insane Trilogy and it's unfortunate that it's still slower than the green gem. I know Kane said that he thought it was like a five second difference, but then I went and timed it myself and I was finding like a 40 second difference and I was like, Kane, how are you timing this? <laughs> it's like Lost City still felt like it still felt much faster to just do the green gem. But thankfully, if you die in Lost City during a marathon run where you can't reset, it's not the end of the world. You can just take the alternate path. Alright. So this is up the creek. It gave me another mask at the beginning and like the one I got in Native Fortress, I'm going to try and carry this all the way into the Lost City. So, preferably don't want to get hit or killed in this level. So when you're going up slopes, like those moss logs, it's beneficial to jump. It's just a little bit faster, and in the case of the moss, it you slide down it if you're stationary, and running up it is slower than normal, so s jumping just saves time. box that was a little scary. Right. So that went well. So next up is the second boss, Ripperoo. He's a bit of an annoying boss if you aren't familiar with how he works. So he's going to jump around the map in set patterns and you have to trap him into an explosion from a bit from a big TNT is what the level labels them as. However, there is a setup that makes the boss fight go by really quickly. There are also damage abuse and strats in this level where you just willingly detonate the TNTs by spinning into them and taking damage, which was the strategy that was used in the original Crash 1. However, I want to hold on to these masks going into the Lost City, so damage abuse strats are about 4 seconds faster, but I feel I, I roughly timed it and you would lose about like maybe 5 to 6 seconds in the Lost City by doing it, so I feel like it's still just very slightly faster to do this and then hold on to the masks. The biggest difference for the boss fights in Crash 1 compared to the original one is that in the original Crash 1, you could ki the each boss fight would automatically give you two masks. However, you could not carry masks out of the fight. In the Unsane Trilogy, you can take masks out of the fight, but it doesn't give you any. So you have to any masks you have in boss fights are masks that you have to bring in there yourself. And it made getting to Ripperoo very annoying before Crash Pro came up with the uh, 
the damageless setup that I just did. So this is the Lost City. This is the only level where we will be getting a gem. Because this is one of the few levels in the game that has a special colored gem. And colored gems open up paths in other levels. Lost City in particular gives you the green gem. Which lets us skip the entirety of the second to last level in the game, Castle Machinery. However, the major downside to colored gems is that they're the only gems in the game where you have to beat the entire level without dying to get them, which is a nod to the original Crash 1 where that was the case with every gem. Because in the original Crash 1, the game didn't save your check- uh, the checkpoints didn't save your box progress. So to get boxes, you had to beat the levels without dying. This was changed in Crash 2 and Crash 3, and then the Unseen Trilogy changed Crash 1 to be more consistent with the Crash 2 and 3. The Great Hall is kind of a level, like pause. Actually, you know, you're right, it's disrespectful. The, the Great Hall is like the hardest level, obviously. Oh no, I jumped way too early. That's really bad. <laughs> I didn't think I would fall down that far. Let's try that again. Pulled board jumps. Is that the thing where you jump on the board where while it's still like going at, back in? Because that's actually still possible to an extent. The window's very tight, but you can do it. So this will be the first of two bonus rounds in the level. The other thing that makes the Lost City very annoying in the Unseen Trilogy. Is that. You have to do bonus rounds now, and there are two bonus rounds in the Lost City. And one of them, the second one is a bit annoying. So yeah. I don't think you can jump on the, the pulling platforms while they're fully into the wall, but you can jump on them while they're going into the wall. I just did a 3D jump there. So, despite this being a 2D section, Crash is a 3D game, so in some levels you can abuse the 3D range to just get past obstacles like that. Unfortunately, you can't do it as much in this game as you can in the original Crash games. They added a lot of invincible wall, invisible walls to side-scrolling sections. So this bonus round has some neat tricks to it, but it's a little precise. Yep. Yep, that's unfortunate. I messed up the timing for that. But what I'm trying to do is that you can spin bounce those crates if you get the timing right and it'll break three of them at once. There we go. That's what I was trying to do. So on the off chance that I had died in the Lost City, and dying in bonus rounds doesn't count. Um, so on the off chance I had died, there are strats in Castle Machinery that allow you to skip sections and just... There's an out-of-bounds trick that lets you skip literally, I believe, half of the level. So it makes an otherwise long level much more manageable, but the green gem is so powerful in the fact that it skips the entire level that it's just worth going for. It adds about an extra minute to the time you spend in the Lost City, like a minute to a minute and a half, but it's it's worth it because you cut out, you take a two minute level like Castle Machinery and turn it into a 20 second level. So this is Temple Ruins. I would have liked to have invincibility here, but it didn't work out like that, but it's not a big deal. I'll just do a corner cut here. Another one here. Yep. 
Slow is tricky to do quickly. There are a lot of holes you can fall into, and it's not big on checkpoints, so you can you can lose a lot of time for dying here. So if I had had two masks here, I would have damaged abuse through this fire. Uh, I only have one though, and there's another one coming up in the level, and I want to keep both of them for the next level, Road to Nowhere. Or I could not get a spin in the bats, so... I guess Road to Nowhere is going to be a little slower as well. It's not be Oh, man. That's actually a really annoying jump. What happened is I got caught in the fire torch, so... It slowed down my momentum a bit. So let's try that again. This corner cut in particular is nice because it means I don't have to wait on that flame torch. All right, this jump is a really annoying due to depth perception, so I'm going to wait it out a little bit to be safe. Once flame skip, eventually. So flame skip is a thing that you can do in both the original Crash One and the Insane Trilogy, where those flame torches. There are some of them where if you jump far enough to the right side, you can actually dodge the flame entirely. It's tricky to do in the Insane Trilogy, just because the the window for it is small, and Crash's hitboxes are rounded, so you could just slip off. Temple Ruins is the worst meme in OG. Yeah, Temple Ruins is an annoying level overall, but in the original trilogy, it's definitely... It's, it's a level. This is Road to Nowhere. This is the first of two bridge levels. Bridge levels are kind of infamous in the Insane Trilogy because the second one, the High Road, has become notorious for its difficulty due to the way they changed jump mechanics. Crash jumps overall a little lower in this game. Well, a little. He jumps quite a bit lower. <laughs> Somehow I managed to spin over the, that checkpoint without touching it. So I could have skipped that middle plank, but I didn't want to risk dying. Dying in Road to Nowhere can be very unforgiving. I also could have just damage abused off that hog, but I didn't think to. Uh, that's the one like really precarious jump in the level. You're supposed to bounce on the turtle's shell in order to knock it upside down and bounce on his belly. However, you can make the jump without the turtle. It's a lot tighter, but it's also a lot faster, so. Hey, Rebag. Crash 2 sucks. Yeah, it, it, it can suck sometimes. Yeah, I would not recommend doing Crash 2 for fun, especially not Hundo. Crash 2 Hundo gets really stressful. All right, so this is Boulder Dash. This is the second chase level. This one I unfortunately can't break every box in the level because there's a hidden section that you can only access with the purple gem. The boulder is also oh so kind and lets you, and it, it breaks crates for you in this version, which admittedly makes the game 
it makes the level much easier, which has its ups and downs, but from a speed perspective, from a speed perspective, it's very useful. So this is Sunset Vista. This is the longest level in the category, or in the Crash 1 portion of the category. Actually, it might also be the longest run in the category in general for full trilogy. I don't think it's a particularly difficult level. It's just very long and tedious. However, you can get through things a little quicker with just in certain spots. I skipped that first flame torch just by running at it. You have enough time to get through it and then I did the same thing with the, that three set of pushers. In OG this level is free. That is true. In the original crash... Oh no. I mistimed that. In the original... Uh, Crash 1, there was a out of balance glitch you could do in Sunset Vista that let you just run, a, run along the top of the camera. Obviously not in Ensign Trilogy. There we go, that's better. That wasn't that bad of a death. Alright. Thanks for stopping by, White Paws, and thanks for, for the good luck. So this section, you can actually just stand in the center of those and not get pushed out. I went down, didn't I? I love Twitch. So I skipped that checkpoint just because if I don't, I'm not able to catch this cycle. Makes things a little risky, but overall, very important to do. It's a pretty big amount of time saved because that cycle is very long to sit through. Oh, how? How did I fall all the way down here? Falling in the wrong place in these levels can be very annoying. I have to wait this cycle out so I just break these crates in the meantime. So there's a neat little trick here. You can actually jump behind this wall, which makes that entire platforming section trivial. So, yeah. 
I was able to stand on that fire a lot sooner than the hitbox would imply. This section can be annoying if the if the platforms don't line up properly. It looks like they are right now though. Nope, not that one. Not that one either. So yeah. This one should be one. Yeah, there we go. And that's Sunset Vista. So I had some setbacks there just from missing some jumps, but overall that wasn't that bad. So next is the third boss, Koala Kong. This guy's got an element of randomness to him, so. So what Koala Kong's gonna do is he's gonna throw these giant rocks at me and I have to either avoid them or spin them and then he's gonna throw one at me that I can send back to him. But when he throws it is a matter of chance and whether or not these minecarts in front of him protecting him like that one was. Yeah, he took his sweet time with that one and now the minecarts conveniently in the way. That was some bad luck. This one's annoying also. There we go. So I stand on that last TNT because on the off chance that Koala Kong throws it early, he can throw it right into the TNT and detonate and get it out of the way. Yep, mine carts are being very mean. Not a great Koala Kong, but yeah. So that's all I'm into. We're going on to Island 3. And this levels or this island has a lot of really tricky levels. Heavy machinery can be annoying just because the sheer amount of obstacles and enemies are condensed closer together. It's a side scrolling level, so there's not much you can do in the way of jumping around them. However, this level does also give you quite a bit of masks, which adds a lot of potential for invincibility. And you don't even have to use that falling platform, you can just drop down like that. The spike, the spinning spike bots cannot be hurt, so I just have to dodge them in general. That was poor timing. Sometimes I can get through that cycle, and then other times I can't. So. Just depends on when the steam vent decides to go off. This one, you generally can't get around. And I don't want to damage boost through them because there's another invincibility coming up. And there will also be an invincibility coming up in the next level that I really want to use.
that went much slower than it could have gone. If you graze the side of the the bounce pads, you can actually get the boost without landing on them. Also, anybody just coming in, the reason I'm commentating it is because if this run goes really well, I'll use it as my submission video for AGDQ full trilogy. Levels of Cortex Power. Going through this level quickly can be tricky because there's a lot of electric fences that you're supposed to wait on. However, there's a setup that lets you only have to wait on one of them. However, there is also a cycle towards the end that is a little difficult to catch, and I'll just play it by ear when I get to it. Oh, I jumped too early, but that's okay. This level has two, uh, Masks, masks in it, so even though I took that straight hit, I can still get the invincibility. Well, it messed up my timing a little bit, so I did some waiting there. So if I miss this cycle, it doesn't lose too much time in this level. However, it will could lose me a bit of time in later levels just from losing the masks. But thankfully, uh, it lined up because I lost some time earlier in the level. So... The second invincibility is always the one I want to go for, so even though I took that uh, early hit, it didn't really matter, aside from being immobilized for a few seconds. If I hadn't taken that stray hit, I would have just skipped that first mask. The second mask is more beneficial because it lets me run through more of the electric fences. And the first mask doesn't run out by the time I get to the second one. So this is generator room. Personally not a fan of this level. It's got some really tricky jumps. Invisibility is not super important in this level, but it helps me get through that section quicker and also lets me get all of those four boxes in rapid succession. So I can do diagonal jumps here. I'm not completely comfortable with them and it loses a lot of time to die in this section because I would be sent all the way back to that first checkpoint. Oh, that's unfortunate. I didn't mean to do that. It's going to lose me a couple seconds in uh, toxic waste. So I did a a diagonal jump there just to save some time cutting by cutting that corner. I could have done a second one, but my setup felt off and I didn't want to risk getting hit or dying or both. So. Overall it went solidly though. So this next level is Toxic Waste. To newcomers to this series and to, to casual players, this level is very annoying because it's a very linear, straightforward level. However, because of that, it's actually pretty straightforward. And One of the tamer levels on this island, essentially you just run straight and jump over these barrels. It's 
next section is probably the one that trips people up because they add bouncing ones into the mix. However, there's a nice subtle hint on the floor. There are these dent marks and wherever the, wherever, or like there are dent marks or scuff marks and wherever the markings are, that's where the barrel will land. And I think, I like that kind of hint. It's not like blatantly in your face, like this is what you should do, but it's a nice nod for people who notice it. But I personally didn't notice it myself until I saw a post about it online that mentioned it and I was like, oh, that's really neat. So this is the next boss fight. This is Pinstripe. He has six hit points and he shoots a gun at you and you have to hide behind his furniture and wait for an opening and hit him. So there's an opening here, but I'm going to let him go just because it will make his fourth cycle much quicker. Essentially, if I had not hit him, then at the end of this section, he would have ended up on the right side. However, his four cycle, you can only hit him from the left. So you want him to be on the left side as quickly as possible. Also, curiously enough, I can stand next to the furniture and he still can't hit me. So if I hadn't let him go at the beginning of the fight, then he would have ended he would have started the fourth phase on the right side and he would have jumped from the right to the center to the left and it just takes more time I believe there was a setup found a couple days ago or maybe even yesterday that makes that boss fight even quicker so that's something to look into as well probably saves about six seconds All right now we get on to the most infamous level in the game, which is the high road. This level has tripped up many, many players since the Unseen Trilogy was released. It has a lot of very precarious jumps that even when done properly can be very annoying just because of the altered jump height. So hopefully it doesn't mess with me. So you're, again, you're supposed to use these turtles. Oh, yep, I messed that jump up. So there's two... Most of these turtle jumps you can make without the turtles. There are two, however, at the very beginning where you do need the turtles. However, even then, you can bypass it by using the rope to the side. However, the rope is a little finicky. It's got a very narrow hitbox, and sometimes Crash just slips off it, so... It's just not safe to stand on, so I only use it in these two instances. This will be the second one. And I missed it again. I'm, o I'm overshooting it, which is the issue. Oh, there we, go. there we go. The rest of these I should be able to make without the rope or the turtles. It's just those first two very early on that can be very, very annoying. Those hogs also, I didn't mention this in Road to Nowhere, they are invulnerable to regular hits. You can only knock them out with invincibility. So... This is where turtle hitboxes are very kind. The turtles have an odd hitbox where their neck and their tail have hitboxes. So when they're right side up, that makes them kind of annoying to hit because they can hit you when they are seemingly very far away from you. However, when they're upside down, it makes reaching them very useful. So that one jump to the first turtle, it looked like I might have not been able to make it, but it's actually a very easy to jump to pull off. So. That was a fairly average high road. The first, the two deaths early on were unfortunate, but I've had much worse ones, and I've only ever had a handful that were deathless because th that level does just trip you up. So, and now we're on to slippery climb. I would say at the current point in time. Doing this level optimally probably makes it the hardest level in the game, just because there are some really neat box strats that let you break a lot more crates than normal, but 
They're tricky to pull off, so I'll attempt them, but if they go south, I'll start playing the level safe. Yep, I messed that one up a bit, so I'm not even going to bother going for that jump. Oh no, yeah, I got caught up. That's what this level does sometimes. Yep, I got caught up again. Yeah, I'm, I'm slipping it, so I'll probably play this level safe as a result. I don't want to lose even more time. This level only has one checkpoint in it, so Dying is extremely punishing. I've lost many runs to Slippery Climb. So I'll leave those two. So there actually is a really neat trick right here that I'm not going to be able to do, where this spike that I'm under right now, if you have a mask, you can actually jump into it, and during the damage damage boost, if you mash X at like the right time, you can actually rocket all the way up to the top of the level and just stand on the, the ceiling and run to the end of the level. It's called the hyper jump, but to get it consistently requires a mask. Uh, I have yet to get it in a like real run just because first off even with the mask the trick is a little precise to pull off and because this level comes immediately before the or immediately after the high road sometimes you just don't have a mask. That was probably the trickiest jump I'm gonna go for. Likewise, I can grab those crates, but getting them is a bit of a challenge, and dying at this moment would be very bad. So. And aside from that death early on, that went pretty alright, although I did take it pretty safe. But that's about on par with how it went in my PB, I think. Maybe a little worse just because of the death. I think I had a death in my PB also, but it was not as bad of a death. Alright. So hopefully that means the worst is behind us, though. So next we're getting to the lights out. This is a level that is set completely in the dark. Aku Aku serves as your light source. So as long as you have him, he'll illuminate the path for a while and then you just get another one of them to relight the path. However, if you take damage at any point, the level immediately becomes pitch black and much more annoying. Hopefully that doesn't happen, but if it it has a higher chance of happening towards the end of the level, and if that happens, I can lose quite a bit of time because the last checkpoint is only about midway through. That's the last checkpoint in the level. Oh, that was close. So 
Uh, these sites are the main problem. This cycle in particular always trips me off. I think I can get through it and then I just barely miss it. Right. That went well though. The next level is Jaws of Darkness. It's the last level in the game that has any masks in it. And for the sake of safety, I would like to take at least one out of it all the way to the end of the run. Because the last few bosses can be very tricky, and they're very unforgiving if you die in them. Any boss is unforgiving if you die in it at the wrong time, but the last two, I feel, are a bit easier to die in. So... Hopefully this level's kind to me and I'm able to take masks out of it, but Jaws is also a very annoying level. It's got some corner cuts in it that save quite a bit of time, but are also a little scary to do. I can actually run through that one, that spear section, without having to wait. There's the first corner cut, and thankfully I got it. This section is very annoying sometimes. There we go. Those slamming door cycles or whatever can be annoying as well. Come on, okay. This platform's a little weird sometimes, like, I have to be right in the center for it to move, or if I jump onto it early, it just takes its time. So I actually could have damage abused on that pillar just for another corner cut. I didn't do it just for the sake of keeping this mask. I forgot to do a corner cut there, but I got the second one, so it's fine. I could have gotten two corner cuts and just skipped the bottom platform. And we're out. That went really well. This level also has an obnoxious amount of crates. The main portion has a lot of crates that are on hidden paths, and then there's two bonus rounds, so I think the total number of crates in that level is 112, which is the most out of any level in Crash 1, I believe. Including the bonus level, Stormy Ascent, which is the longest and most difficult level in the game. But we don't do it in any percent, so it won't matter. So this is Castle Machinery. This is the level that is where the green gem is going to come in handy. That skips the entire level. So a two minute level becomes a 20 second level with that green gem. So next up is the second to last boss fight, which is the fight with Dr. Nitrous Brio. So this is a multi-phase fight. He's gonna throw beakers at you, the green ones create blobs that you have to bounce on, and then they'll squirt at him and he'll take damage, and then there are purple ones that just explode and you have to avoid those.
I have to be careful because if I accidentally hit him twice at the same time, there is a glitch that can occur where he just stops throwing things and he has like this weird clipping animation. And if that happens, I have to restart the fight. Like that, that was very dangerous. I've never had the glitch happen to me, but I've seen it happen to others. Uh, another runner in particular, Ukog, he had the glitch happen to him on a world record pace run, which was extremely unfortunate. So this is the second phase. When you get him down to one hit point, he just drinks his potion, he hulks out, and then you have to jump on his head. I don't think Ukog Monkey is bad. So, yeah. so now we're getting to the last full level of the game, which is the lab. This level is pretty straightforward, but it can be tricky. So you can spin the blobs in this level, you couldn't spin them in the Brio fight. So I have to hit these exclamation boxes to open these gates or activate bridges. So these guys are nice because you can just jump around them, which is something they carried over from the original Crash 1. You're supposed to wait for them to not be shocking, and then you just like spin them into the abyss, but you can just jump around them, which is faster and I feel safer. <laughs> So, that guy actually spun into a bunch of TNTs that were surrounding that exclamation box. That was also a trick that they carried over from the original game. I'm going to abuse the right side here, just because this bridge can be precarious. We're on a good path. So all we have left is the Great Hall and then the fight with Cortex. So, there's not much of a level here. The Great Hall is the level that you visit after you've collected every gem in the game, and it gives you the alternate ending. But we don't have every gem, so... So, this is the fight with Cortex. He can be very tricky, especially in his third phase, however, because I have two masks, I should be safe. So he's gonna fire these rays at us. The purple ones he fires directly at you, the green ones he also does, but you can deflect the green ones back. The blue ones that he's firing, he fires to the side, and then they come across the screen and you just have to jump over them or not jump into them. There we go. This third phase is annoying because he's going to fire blue ones that alternate between the top and the bottom. But I found that if I stay in the center like this, I'm less likely to get hit by them. Just like that. 
but it is a very scary situation to be in. This last, this second to last phase here can also be annoying just because he rapid fires. In the last phase, he just fires a single green one at you. Alright. So I got the final hit on him, so I can actually just immediately quit out of the level and go to the next game. Because the requirement for full trilogy any percent is to meet the any percent requirements, or meet the requirement for every single any percent category, and the requirement for Crash 1 is to na land the final hit on Cortex. So because I got that, I was able to just quit out of the fight and move on to Crash 2. So each of the three Crash games, even in the Insane Trilogy, they differ vastly amongst each other. So they they differ vastly from the original games, and then they differ between each other. So things are going to change up quite a bit with Crash 2. All right. So after I skip the cutscene, I'm going to be greeted with this intro level. In the original Crash 2, if you skip the cutscene, it also just skipped the intro, but here it just warps you to the beginning of the intro. But conveniently, I can go into the I can go to the start menu, quit out, and it sends me to the warp room anyway. <laughs> so I still don't have to do the the intro level in this game. Hey Roach. How are you? So immediately things look very different from Crash 1. So the first thing to note is that we have a warp room now, so instead of going from the first level to the next level to the next level to the next level, I'm given a group of five and I can complete them in any order. So I'm going to start with level five and then go backwards. Having trouble getting get Discord to not be heard on stream. Um, I'll look at it after this, Roach. I don't have work tomorrow, so I can be up for a while. And the other big thing is that in this game, Crash now has access to his slide. So sliding is the fastest form of movement in the any percent categories. However, you cannot constantly slide. There is a bit of a cooldown period. So... Between every slide, you want to spin, which brings you back down to your base running speed. However, it's still faster than sliding, stopping, and then sliding and stopping. One thing you'll notice is that the original Crash 2 had a movement mechanic known as the neutral slide spin, where you would slide, and then you would let go of all directional input, and then when you spun, you would maintain all of the, all of the slide momentum throughout the entirety of the spin. Neutral slide spin is for the most part removed in the Insane Trilogy. You can still do it on ice, however, it does not work on ground. So in this game, the fastest form of movement is just regular slide spin, which overall, it has its positives and its negatives. Sl regular slide spinning is on a whole a little slower than neutral slide spin. However, it also, the barrier to entry for the game is much lower, which I think is beneficial because the games are still not like super easy, but it makes it easier for new newcomers to pick it up. Additionally, I feel, at least to me, it feels like they increase the speed of the slide spin in this game compared to the original Crash 2, like the regular slide spin, which I think might be a factor of Crash's base running speed being faster. So the reason I'm doing this warp room in reverse order has to do with the masks again. So the mechanics for all the Crash games are consistent, aside from like Crash having a more limited moveset in Crash 1. So in Crash 2 and Crash 3, 
invincibility does make you go faster in terms of your base running speed. However, it doesn't affect your slide spin speed. And overall, slide spinning and invincibility are extremely comparable. So because there's this little animation when you get invincibility at the start, where Crash will go invincible and then he'll jump in the air, uh, in many cases it's not beneficial to go for invincibility. In fact, it is a detriment. It's a very slight one, but it is a detriment. So the level order is designed where I only have access to masks when I'm looking for invincibility. And then I can easily bypass it when I don't need it. So I started with level 5 because the chase levels do not allow you to take masks into, into them. So if you enter a chase level with masks, you'll automatically lose every one you have. So, I enter that one first just because I don't have any masks anyway, and I do want to leave this warp room with two masks, because I won't be abusing invincibility in the first warp room, but I will be abusing it twice or three times in the second warp room. And because Crash Dash is the last level in the warp room, and it takes away your masks, I don't want to do it last. And it is more optimal to do the warp room in order of the doorways, if you can. So I just do Crash Dash first and then go backwards from 5 to 4 to 3 to 2 to 1. So I skip that mess there because I don't want the invincibility right now. This level's Hang 8. There's a timer in the bottom right corner of the level where if I reach the end of the level before that timer runs out, I'll be awarded a special timer gem. However, I'm going to avoid that gem because it takes time to throw it up in the warp room. And additionally, this level has is the first one in the series to have the purple crystals, so... Unlike Crash 1, where you just have to get to the end of the level, in Crash 2 and Crash 3, I also have to gather the crystals in order to complete the level. However, the crystals are all in the main path, so it's extremely difficult to miss any of them. So this level is Snuggo. There's a mask right here and I'm going to jump over it because masks still aren't benefit or invincibility still isn't beneficial in this level. Okay, I got a diagonal that I didn't want. So you can do neutral slide techs, like neutral slide spin and neutral slide jump on ice. So the fastest form of movement on ice for the most part is just chaining a together a bunch of neutral slides. So just slide, let go of the directional input, slide again and so on and so forth. There are some situations where it is, all, it is more beneficial to do a neutral slide spin or a neutral slide jump. And these are usually, for the slide spin, is if there's an enemy in my way. And then for slide jumping is if I want to jump over a hole. So like right here, I did a sl neutral slide jump. And there I did another one. Ice does have this little finicky uh, factor to it though is that if you jump over a surface that's not ice so a floor like a wooden floor snow or even even a crate or an enemy sometimes you just lose all of your sliding momentum so that's a little quirk that has to be dealt with but overall the ice physics are very useful for going quick 
in a lot of situations. <laughs> if this got into AGDQ, am I ready for all the wool memes in chat? <laughs> well, thankfully, I don't think I'll be looking at uh, the chat during the run. So. That's inevitable regardless of a crash game. Regardless of what crash game or what crash category gets in. So even if only one of these, one of the any percent categories got in separately as opposed to all of them together, there will still be well memes. So this mud, you can actually slide spin through it. You're supposed to wade very slowly through it, but if you start a slide spin before entering it and then you maintain the slide speed, the slide spin, you can just slide spin through it and it just saves time. One thing of note with slide spinning is that I want to maintain straight lines as much as I can. It is very slow to turn during the spin of a slide spin. Like it just almost negates all of your momentum. So what I'm doing to get over these pits is something they carried over from the original Crash 2 and 3, which is called the Glitch High Jump. So that name's a bit of a misnomer because it was a glitch in the original game, but I fully believe it was intentionally added to the Insane Trilogy. And what it is is that if you do a crouching jump or a slide jump, which is which normally gains it gains more height than a regular jump, if you spin during the ascent you get an even higher jump and that lets me jump over those pits that are otherwise very annoying to get to get out of because you either have to get lucky with a glitch high jump to get out of it or there are a bunch of moles in the level or in the pits that pop out and you have to kill all of them and then a mushroom spawns that lets you get out so this is the first boss fight this is Ripperoo. he is a painfully easy boss fight he is an auto scroller he w leaves these TNTs in a set pattern Pattern never changes. I just stand in a specific portion of the level that he doesn't fill with TNTs. I wait for him to blow himself up, and then he starts slaying nitros. I wait for him to blow himself up on those, and then I hit him. And that's all there is to this fight. It is... It's probably the most significant breather in the entire run, because there's no difficulty to it whatsoever. Hey, Ivan. I'm doing all right. Thanks for the good luck. Hello. I mean, this is an HF. Uh, HFDQ, or is it, this is an HRDQ, that's tomorrow, and I'm on backup for it, not, uh, I'm not in the main lineup, so. Roach got in for HRDQ, though, so that's really cool. But yeah, that's all, that's all there is to Ripperoo, it's not a difficult fight. Weird way to spell HDDQ. I mean, I'm trying to find out what the F is in the HFDQ, because I thought it was Harvey Relief, not Harvey Feeleaf. Alright. So now I go up to the second warp room, and the first level I'm going to enter is Snowbiz. This is the first level where I'm going to make use of invincibility, and ideally I'm going to use it twice. Been practicing Crash 2 Hundo. How's that been going? There, that was the neutral slide jump, which let me just rocket forward to that platform. So this will be the first invincibility. These porcupines cannot be attacked while they have their spikes up, but if I'm invincible, I can just run right through them. But I can also just use the invincibility to jump through this piston. The pistons stop moving if you're invincible.
Another neutral slide jump. Oh, that was a little, that was a little scary. I was, looked like I was pretty deep into that hole, but I got through anyway. All right, so the second invincibility is coming up. Yep, but uh, uh, that was a s situation where I lost the ice momentum. Overall went solid though. So next is the eel deal. Hi Coco, bye Coco. <laughs> so in the Unseen Trilogy you can actually unlock the ability to play as Crash's sister Coco. However, she doesn't function any differently from Crash aside from some minor hitbox differences. And it's slower to pick her up so we don't use her in Crash 1 or Crash 2. So I'm going to use Invincibility in this level as well. And yeah, I'm doing Trifecta Ivan. I'm using this as a submission video for AGDQ if it goes well, which so far it has been. So, because I'm submitting all three categories separately and then I'm submitting full trilogy any percent, um, I figured it'd be nice to have this as a, as its own, like, submission video. Oh, that's unfortunate, but I'm probably going to lose these masks anyway, so. The hitbox of Coco is very slightly different, like, it almost never comes up, but there are a couple situations where it theoretically could. I think some of the skips in completion categories are easier with Coco, just because it's easier to line things up with her, in my experience, but that could entirely be placebo, and it's not like they're significantly harder with Crash, they just take a different set of timing, so it's more beneficial to just learn how to do them with Crash. Although I do think playing as Coco would be a really nice, like, donation incentive or donation war for, like, a GDQ. It's just, like, play ver play as Crash versus play as Coco. Wouldn't matter in Crash 3 because you play as both of them. But for Crash 1 and Crash 2 it would be neat. So this is the second chase level. This is Crash Crush. So the reason I'm doing the Warp Room in this order is that this level and the level I'm going to do right after it take your masks from you. So I wanted to abuse the invincibility in the two levels where I would have been able to, which were Snowbiz and... and the Eel Deal. And you can have masks in the level 7 Air Crash, but because of the way the... Because of the way we do the level, you'll never leave the level with masks. So, we save it for the last part of the run. Or the last part of the warp room. These electric fences are a little annoying. If you mistime your slide, you can run into the fence and you'll die. However, with proper timing, you can just slide spin under them. Is there any kind of wall boost here? No. As far as I know, there's no wall boost in the same trilogy. So yeah, in the original Crash game, there was this weird property in the first two chase levels and all three of the river levels, where if you slid along the wall, like diagonally, you would get a speed boost that was, I think, akin to a zigzag. 
However, zigzagging does not work in the Unseen Trilogy, and the wall boost, as far as I know, does not either. I mean, I guess zigzag technically works in the Unseen Trilogy, it just slows you down, so it's definitely not worth doing. I remember I tested it in the high road, and I did a zigzag off of a turtle jump, and it was like the easiest turtle jump in the entire level, and I missed it because I zigzagged, and I just didn't make the jump. So this is the first bear level. This is Barret. So this is kind of like the hog level in Crash 1. Uh, there's there's more to it though, so it's not a complete auto scroll. You can actually do charges to speed up the polar bear. His name is Polar. <laughs> However, you cannot constantly charge. It's just a short burst. So to go fast in this level, before the charge runs out, you have to jump. Because you, you can charge again out of landing from a jump. So. If the charge runs out before I jump, though, there's a noticeable amount of cooldown before I can do it again. There. I had a dropped uh, input there. Crash games have a tendency to drop your inputs, just because of how many inputs you can put in at once, but the Unseen Trilogy, thankfully, so far feels much more forgiving in terms of inputs being dropped. I don't drop nearly as many as I did in the original games, but it does still happen. So the last level in this warp room is Air Crash. I'm going to be using a neat little skip in this level. Which is also part of the reason I left it for last. Also, inv using invincibility in this level would be near pointless. Because the first mask in this level was right before a jet board. And you can't keep invincibility on the jet boards. And the second invincibility is, or the second mask in the level is at a point that I'm not going to reach for reasons I'm going to show very soon. So there's no point in having masks in this level. So I'm going to skip this checkpoint. And I'm going to grab the crystal and I'm going to death abuse, which will take me back to the very first checkpoint. So what I just did is I took a secret exit. There are five levels in the game that have secret exits that unlock special entrances to either... There's two new secret levels that only have gems in them, and then there's three alternate entrances to levels that give you access to more boxes or a secret gem and such. So Air Crash is one of these levels that has a secret exit and unlocks the red gem path for Snowgo, but that's not what we care about. So the reason I took that secret exit is that it's much faster to grab the crystal, death abuse back to the first checkpoint, and then take the secret exit to leave the level, and then just use the center platform to go back up to the second warp room. And this trick was actually not useful in the original Crash 2 because the secret warp room didn't have the center platform, so to get out of the secret warp room you would have had to enter one of the levels that you unlocked, and then exit out of it. But in the Unseen Trilogy, because you can ride just back just ride back up to the top, you can it's much quicker than just finishing the rest of Air Crash. And on a whole, I believe it saves I wanna say eight to ten seconds and potentially more. So it's most notable in Air Crash. I'll be doing it again in another level called Digging It. However, it's not as useful in that level. It saves maybe two seconds, which is still a time save, so we go for it, but it's most notable in Air Crash because the secret exit is right at the beginning and there's a checkpoint right next to it. Every other secret exit 
is either like at the very end of the level or it's very close to the end of the level so in most cases they're not worth it in the case of digging it it's just far enough away from the end of the level where it's a little useful but it's definitely most useful in air crash because the you the secret exit is at the very beginning and the crystal is only about halfway through the level so that was komodo bros i kind of just glossed over them and didn't even explain them at all uh, essentially the big guy was spinning the little guy at me and I had to dodge him and wait for him to get dizzy and stop moving and then I would spin him into the big guy. Crash 2 is not particularly like known for having hard bosses. Crash in general's bosses aren't backbreakingly difficult but Crash 2 especially has fairly easy and straightforward ones. So This is the third and final chase level in the game. This is unbearable. And it differs a little bit from the original, from the original, or from, not from the from the other two chase levels. So if the name didn't give it away, you get chased by a giant bear in this level, as opposed to a boulder. So the reason I slide jump on these bridges instead of slide spin is that they have this weird property where they slow down your slide and your spin. So I believe it's a little faster to slide jump over them as opposed to slide spinning. Oh, almost fell in that hole, that would've been bad. And if this level couldn't get cool enough, the last portion you ride polar. So you're on a bear being chased by a bear. And you can jump over these fences, which is very nice. Makes this entire ending portion much simpler. So Unbearable also has a secret exit, but it's so close to the end of the level that it's, it loses time to do. So the next level I'll be entering is Bear Down. I'm entering this before the level that was between between it and Unbearable because they both take masks from you and I want to have masks in the other levels. So This is the second full bear level and it'll be the last we'll be seeing a polar. So I did a glitch high jump there just because the cliffs have a weird property where if you slide off them it'll just take away all your momentum so it's just <laughs> better just jump over the cliff I find this level much trickier than Barret it's a bit more densely compact so you can if you hug the wall right there you can dodge these guys with the ice blocks even when they're holding them up ideally you either jump over them or you sl you run under them depending on what position they're in but I was able to jump to their side just by hugging the wall, which was discovered by Stuart, uh, another Crash 2 runner. He has the current world record for 102%, and I believe, yeah, he has the current world record for 102%. He's second place in 100%, and then he's second place in any percent to me, and we traded the world record for quite a while before he took a break. And he's also, incidentally, the world record holder for all but one category in the original Crash 2 and in that one category he has second place which is 100% so so yeah that's all of Bear Down that's all there is to Polar which is fortunate or unfortunate depending on who you ask I'm not the biggest fan of Polar levels but there are much worse vehicle levels
Alright. So now I'm gonna enter Road to Ruin. This level has two masks in it, and ideally I want to leave with both. This level is much more annoying in completion categories because there's some tricky jumps that you have to do. It's not as bad in any percent. There are some corner cuts you can do, but overall it's a rather tame level, and I enjoy it a lot. How did that not work? Well, that's unfortunate. That means the next level is going to be a little slow as a result because I wanted to take two masks out of this level. So that was a very annoying death. Because the next level I'm going to enter a sewer later, and it is a level where masks are very, very useful, and I would have very much preferred having invincibility early on, but hopefully I can still do get through it well without that. Essentially, there's just a lot of obstacles in sewer later that are annoying to run through. and the invincibility just makes plowing through them much easier. Hey Colin, I know there can be a relay without a race, but even then I feel like it would be very difficult to set up. I'm not even certain that they would accept all three games. I'm just submitting this as collateral mostly, because it is a huge time, uh, time eater. So, if you wait a little bit on those flamethrower guys, you can actually slide through their flame or around it and then just hit them, which is a nice change from the original game where their the flame hitbox is absolutely massive and hard to get through. I'm going to wait this guy out because I want to hold on to this uh, invincibility. Oh, yeah. right, here we go. So I didn't get the invincibility as early as I wanted, but I'll still have it, which is nice. Take that lined up where I could just get the invincibility again. That didn't go as good as I could have, but ultimately I think I still saved time over my PB, because in my PB I think I died in that level. So, or at least lost a significant amount of time in it. That level and the level I'm about to do are my two most notable places I could save time in my PB. So, next level is plant food. This is the last river level. I really am not a fan of this level. It is very tricky to do. There are a lot of tricky jumps and you can get tripped up very easily and lose time. That first jump is possible with the glitch high jump. It's just a little annoying to pull off. You have to extend your slide quite a bit. And then that jump can be annoying because if you extend your slide too much and you hit the waterfall, you'll automatically die. I'm going to damage abuse here because it lets me get that mask. And you can't have invincibility on the jet board, so there would have been no point in grabbing a third. Right. 
Oh, that was unfortunate, but there's also another mask coming up here, so it doesn't matter. Yeah. Those plants are very annoying to dodge. They reach out a lot farther than you think they would. be careful here these nitros like to jump really high sometimes and if they jump super high at the wrong time I can just die out of randomness but overall that went solidly and losing the masks isn't that big of a deal because we're about to enter the third boss fight tiny and he's the only he's one of the only two bosses where you can't take masks into him so having any masks at the at the end of that level would be pointless anyway so, it's just convenient to do plant food last because you damage abuse. Usually twice. So. Tiny is a very annoying fight because like Koala Kong in Crash 1, there's an element of randomness to it. So, you're going to be in this section with a 3x3 grid of falling platforms. And Tiny's going to chase you and you have to trick him into jumping into a spot where a platform has fallen. So. And the formation in which they fall has a bit of randomness to it. Crash 2 and even like Crash 1 and Crash 3, like all the Crash games have very little RNG. This fight and the Koala Kong fight are probably like the most notable cases. Thankfully they're pretty devoid of it otherwise. So that worked out. I went down again. That's alright. This is what local recording is for. Well, that worked out. Overall, pretty solid. Alright, we'll be entering the fourth warp room now. This warp room has a lot of mask strategies and abuse, like mask abuse and invincibility. So it's very easy to lose quite a bit of time in this warp room. Hopefully that doesn't happen, but it's very possible. Out of all five warp levels in this warp room, this first one I'm entering is the only one where I don't abuse masks in some way. So this first level, this is behaving. Uh, you get chased by bees in this level. I don't like bees, therefore I don't like this level. <laughs> um, there is one mask in this level that hopefully I'll be able to carry over into the next level. So this warp room in general is crazy in the sense that not only do you not want to die, you also don't want to take any straight hits except for maybe one or two in some spots. Like even the boss fight you want to carry two masks out of it, so masks are very vital to this warp room. Yeah. So the way you're supposed to dodge the bees, hold on, so I can also abuse the uh, side thing from Bear Down to get past that electric fence in this level. However, the way you're supposed to avoid the bees is you're supposed to dig into this red dirt and the bees can't get you while you're down there. That's pretty slow though, so thankfully slide spin is fast enough where you can dodge the bees anyway. Those bombs are very annoying. They can catch you while they're still descending to the ground and then they'll hit you. Yeah, that went really well. Oh, I got stuck on the wall. Right, 
Alright, so this next level is Ruination. It is the evil twin of Road to Ruin. It's a very tricky, evil level. I'm kind of not a fan of it, but at the same time I also think it's a really cool level when it goes, wh goes well. It's just really bad when it doesn't go well. So, we'll see how it goes. That formation is very similar to one in Road to Ruin, except in Ruination there is a Nitro hiding behind it, so... Very, very evil. Ooh, that was really close to the Nitro. So in the original Crash 2, you would Death Abuse right there to reset the cycles to make them more favorable. You can do that in the Unseen Trilogy, except it makes the cycles less favorable, so it's not recommended. However, right here I'm going to damage abuse through these flames. Which lets me get through all of this quicker. So... And then this is the really tricky part. And it worked out, so it's fine. have two masks leaving this level anyway. Alright. So that went well. That went very well. The, the scariest parts of those levels are keeping the mask up to the point where you want to damage abuse and then jumping through all of those sliding uh, platforms or the rotating ones. It's a very tricky and precise maneuver at times. Oh, nope, that's not what I want to enter. I want to enter Cold Heart Crash. So this level is infamous for being very difficult to complete with all boxes and the gem. However, it's not as bad in any percent. And we're going to be making use of what's called the Death Root. So, in a select few levels, there is a special Skull and Crossbones platform that if you reach it without dying from the, since the beginning of the level, you can access what is called the Death Root. It's a harder portion of the level that usually hides either like a gem or boxes or both. So I'm going to skip this checkpoint that way. If for whatever reason I die, I can just start back at the beginning of the level, which will keep the death road open. And then I'm going to damage boost with that TNT. I'm going to wait this penguin out. So this death route, using it skips about an entire third of the level. I want to say. It skips the entire middle portion because when you leave the death route it will just automatically take you to the end portion of the level. So I use invincibility here to get through all this. This is much more difficult without invincibility. And then I slid forward there into the wall so I could avoid that gem. And then... I'm going to try and avoid taking a hit, because keeping these masks for the next level will be very, very important. Thankfully there is a small portion when the porcupines first spike up where you can still hit them. So That last jump is especially scary because if you miss it then like you lose the mask, you lose a lot of time, and but it worked out. So this went well, so because I have two masks, I'm going to enter level 16, Hanging Out. In the original Crash 2, Hanging Out was notably the only level in a speedrun where you wanted to get invincibility, because you move significantly faster on the hangrails if you have invincibility, and there is a lot of hangrail climbing in this level. So 
That translated over in the Unsane Trilogy. This is still a level where invincibility is very useful. However, I likely will not be using the hangrails to abuse the invincibility. And in the original game, there was also a different method that didn't use the hangrails either. That just involved zigzagging across the bottom while you were invincible. So, funnily enough, you can slide through that guy as well, if you wait just a little bit. Hooey. This is like the scariest part, because if I take a hit here, then like everything's just dead. <laughs> you lose quite a bit of time for not getting invincibility in this level. I'm gonna wait these guys out just because I don't want to risk getting hit. Then invincibility, so I should be good. So it is a little bit faster to just slide across the hot pipes like this as opposed to using the. Oh, it's usually faster if you don't get stuck like that, as opposed to using the hangrails. Even with getting stuck, that probably still saved a bit of time over using the hangrails. In the original Crash 2, you can employ a similar method where. Oh, okay. You can employ a similar method where you. jump across the red hot pipes and use zigzagging during your jumps to get through faster than the hangrails. And the current world record holder of Crash 2 100% in the original trilogy, Super Boom Fan, uses that strat. So I took a stray hit and hanging out, and I want invincibility in the next level of digging it. But thankfully there are two masks in digging it, and only the second one only the second invincibility is vital. So Alright, sounds good, Ivan. Thank you for the good luck. So these enemies are going to do everything in their power to make sure I don't get invincibility. Let's hope they fail. So you can do a glitch high jump to get over that hole. These guys are very annoying, but not that hard to avoid. So the invincibility is coming up. So the invisibility is useful here because it lets you bypass all of these electric fences and those fences take forever to wait on and damage abusing through them is not useful. It's not as useful because it forces you to lose masks but ideally I want to take both of these masks out of the level and into the next warp room. My route will change dramatically if I don't. So I do have to wait on this fence, because there's no way to jump over it, and there's no way to jump around it by hugging the wall, unfortunately. Oh boy. So we're coming up to the secret exit out of this level, and we this is the uh, the only other level we'll be using it. Oh, that was a very, very annoying bomb toss. <sighs> that guy, that guy shot that thing right at me. <laughs> so this secret exit saves a couple seconds, not as much as air crash, but it's still a little faster than completing the rest of the level. And the rest of the level does have some very tricky sections, so I will very gladly take the secret exit. So this next boss fight is Engine. 
He is probably the most thought-provoking boss because you fight him in a, he's in a giant mech and you have to destroy both of his arms and both of his shoulders and then his center. And they each have a set amount of hit points that you like throw Wumpa Fruit at him to break. So it's a matter of timing and knowing when you can hit him. The arms both have 10 hit points like they did in the original. They actually buffed the shoulders where in the original they had 5 hit points and I believe in this game they have 11 or 12. So it takes quite a bit of time. So, once you break one of his pieces, he immediately stops attacking, which is advantageous because then he'll stop whatever attack he's in the middle of, which keeps you safe. Unfortunately, it makes it much, much more difficult to break two pieces at the same time, which is a key factor to this fight in the original game. So he didn't fire the last missile because I destroyed the shoulder piece before he got to it. Oh, I missed. There we go. So, it uh, didn't actually lose time because he would have gone around the whole way anyway. So this last section is annoying. He's going to shoot a laser from the center and it's going to destroy the platform. And then he's going to move to either the left or the right and it's random. And I got good luck. So that last section, I think they gave it less hit points than it had in the original Crash 2. In the original Crash 2, it had 5 hit points, and I believe it has 3 or 4 in the Insane Trilogy. It definitely does not feel like 5. The trade-off, however, is that in the original, he would start on the, the center and then always go to the right and then always go to the left. In the Trilogy... It seems that he always goes, he always starts in the center, but then he'll go randomly left or right. So you kind of just have to pick and hope you guess right. If you guess wrong, you can reach him and destroy him before he fires. It's just a lot trickier of a time window. So this level is pissing it away. This is the, this is the level that I wanted to have the two masks for. Because there are a lot of pistons in this level, similar to the ones in the snow levels, except they take much longer and invincibility makes them all stop working. So this entire section just goes by much quicker. Also lets me dodge a lot of these enemies because these, these tentacle bots have really, really annoying hitboxes. So the less I have to deal with them, the better. Conveniently, there is another invisibility right here. that guy out because if I was too late and he pushed me back I would die because he would push me into the hole all right so that went really well and because I managed to keep both max I'm actually going to go into level 25 next, Spaced Out. Uh, in Spaced Out, you don't use invincibility. However, there are some damage abuse strats that I came up with that make the beginning portion significantly faster. 
because normally there are a lot of piston cycles you have to wait on, but if you take damage at the right spot, they, they, they all stop moving for a set period of time. So hopefully I'll get these damage boosts. some momentum there so I backed up a bit but yeah those were the damage boosts I wanted to do essentially all of those pistons stayed up because I had some invulnerability frames so it just makes that entire beginning portion of the level much quicker normally I save this level for last just because it's less traversing through the warp room oh I got a uh I got a clip there where you can slide through the solid uh, object, which is a little tight to pull off, but I managed to get it and wasn't expecting it. Uh, yeah. So normally I save this level for last, just because it's less traversing through the warp room to do the, the warp room entirely in order. However, because I left Piston away with two masks for the sake of safety and not risking losing those last two masks, I just decided to do Spaced Out and I'll do the rest of the warp room backwards. So the next level is Pack Attack. This is the f technically this is the second of two jetpack levels, but it's the first one we'll be visiting. And something I did at the very beginning of Crash 2 will actually matter now, is that when I was exiting the intro, I went into the options and I inverted the controls of jetpack. This loses like two to three seconds. However, In the original Crash 2, the jetpack controls are inverted by default, so that's what I'm used to. So for me, it's just much easier to use inverted controls. And because I do play both the Insane Trilogy and the original Trilogy, it would be very jarring to just switch between them constantly. So these guys try to shock you, and you have to push them into that firewall. Thankfully, you can spin them before they actually shock you. Spinning as a whole is... A little slower so I'm only gonna spin in an attempt to hit enemies break checkpoints and grab that mask so I wasn't gonna reach him in time so I stopped oh that's unfortunate but I'll grab that checkpoint be a little careful here, but it looks like I got a good cycle lineup. Alright, so that was really good. Next level is Night Fight. This will be the only dark level in the run we do. So these differ from the dark levels in Crash 1, where Aku Aku was your light source. Instead, there's a Firefly that's your light source, and you just pick it up on the path, and then eventually it runs out, and then you pick up another Firefly. say the lighting makes this level kind of gorgeous to look at. I guess I failed to mention these green lizard enemies, and by extension the, the similar like tall enemies in the piston levels, you can only kill them through sliding. 
And those spike bots, similarly to the ones in Crash 1, you cannot damage at all. Aside from sniping another enemy in the room. So yeah, these spike enemies, or these tall lizard enemies, I want to slide into them. Solid. Alright, so we're coming up to the last level now. This is Rocket. It's the other jetpack level. It's a lot easier than Pack Attack. It's mu much less obstacles, and it's a lot of just flying through the level. So I'm feeling a bit daring, so if I, if I keep this mask, I'm just going to skip checkpoints because it slows you down to try and spin them. So, yeah, so far I've been doing a good job of keeping them, so... That went really well. Alright, so... I don't want to say for certainty, but this might be world record pace. For, like, Crash 2 specifically. Because the last fight is Cortex. It's a really short, easy fight. He runs away on a jetpack, and you have to hit him. It's notoriously easy in the original game, and they made him even easier in the Unseen Trilogy because there's a little alert that pops up above his head when you're able to hit him. So, this might world record. I don't want to say for sure, but it might. And timing ends when I pick up the- when I close out the window that confirms I got the speed shoes. So, in Crash 2 and the Unseen Trilogy, they, for beating Cortex, you actually get the speed shoes from Crash 3. That was world record. Oh my god, that was like a 20 second world record. So, I can also quit out of the game now, I forgot. <laughs> I can't- that's actually really awesome. I got world record in Crash 2. Well, I did- I already had it, I broke the record again. Oh, I have to... So, yeah, that's pretty awesome. So now we're going into Crash 3.
All right, so this is Crash 3. Again, there's going to be a lot of differences between Crash 2 and Crash 3. Not as much as between Crash 1 and Crash 2, but the differences are there. So the first thing is that we're actually going to use Coco in this run. So there are a lot of levels that are either exclusive to Crash or Coco. And it's faster to grab Coco at the beginning and switch between them than not, because if you try to enter a level with Coco, hold on. If you try to enter a level that's required for Coco, but you try to enter it as Crash and vice versa, there's this long animation where the character you're playing as like falls on their face or falls on their back, and then the other character shows up and enters the level. And then when you exit the level, you're forced to automatically switch back to the other character. It's just a huge time waster, so it's much faster to just alternate between Crash and Coco depending on levels. Additionally, what I did when I was entering the portal was called a quick switch. So when you activate a warp portal, there's actually a bit of time before you can actually enter the level. So during that time frame, you can actually switch between Crash and Coco, and while you're switching, you'll actually enter the level. So it, it saves even more time on switching. So this first level is Orient Express. It's the first of many vehicle levels in the in the game. Uh, Crash 3 has many more vehicle levels just to diversify itself from Crash 2. Uh, the Tiger levels are pretty straightforward. They're like the Polar levels in Crash 2, except you can hold the charge for for constant speed. So essentially, in that level, you hold the charge button and then move forward. So this will be the first platforming level. This is Toad Village. And the mask mechanics work in Crash 3 the same way they do in Crash 2. So. Hey Earl, this isn't a Crash 3 run. This isn't a full trilogy run. I also just PB'd and crashed to any percent by about 19, 20 seconds. Oh, that's unfortunate. I didn't want to take that damage there, but yeah. Masks, thankfully, aren't that important in the first warp room. It's later warp rooms where they'll be important. So yeah, the new world record for Crash 2 is like a 102, 41, or 42 or something. I haven't gone, been able to go back and check it. All right. So next up is Dynamite. This is a prehistoric theme level. It's a chase level, kind of. It's like semi-chase. The beginning of it, you start running towards the screen and you're chased by a giant triceratops, and then the ending is like that also, but the middle portion is a standard level. Yeah, looking at my splits, it looks like it was a 102.42, so it was an 18 second PB. Thank you for the host, Earl.
The first few levels in Crash 3 are extremely straightforward. There's really not much to say about them. So the next level is making waves. This is the first jet ski level in the run. And the jet ski is extremely straightforward. There's really not much to it. You hold the acceleration button and you go straight and you make turns. It's a pretty uneventful it's a pretty uneventful type of level. Thankfully there's only two of them in the run. But it's a bit of a breather. Uh, what's my trilogy PB? It's 32651, which is what it says on the splits right there. Which converted to loadless, I believe, is like 242 something. So, in the Ensign Trilogy, we do loadless timing just because the... And I know you know this, Earl, but I'm using this as an AGDQ submission video, so I'm explaining it for playback. Um, the Insane Trilogy does loadless timing because the load times vary greatly between PS4 models. Most specifically, the PS4 Standard and the PS4 Slim have much slower load times than the PS4 Pro. So, the PS4 Pro saves about 3 minutes on load time, so for the sake of fairness, we just use loadless timing. And I'm currently running on a PS4 Standard, but I plan on picking up a PS4 Pro very soon. So when I was reaching that crystal, I just decided to damage abuse through the bombs that were in the way. This was just because it's a little quicker to do that than maneuvering around the bombs, and I'm going to pick up another mask soon anyway, so it doesn't matter. Hey, gaming expert. Yeah, the pro load times are much faster, which is why I'm really, which is why I'm seriously considering getting one. Like, it's almost guaranteed. All I have to do is confirm with my friend that he's going to buy my standard from me, but that should be, like, within a week, actually, or so. So. And then I made sure to switch to Crash before I entered Under Pressure, so. Yes, Chris still has world record, but I'm currently on pace to beat it. Because Chris's record is, if I remember correctly, is a 324, and I'm 8 minutes ahead of my PB, so this is looking to be 318. So the movement tech in Under Pressure is... You want to mash square and X at the same time, because... Mashing X gives you a kick where you just move a little faster, but the fastest movement in general is spinning. It gives you a huge momentum boost, but you can't do it constantly. So you want to spin, and then when you when you can't spin, you want to slide. Let's see if I can get this. Nope, I wasn't lucky enough, but that's fine. Do I have a 4K HDR TV? No, I'm using a 1080p monitor. I'm not that interested in the 4K, to be honest. I just want the better load times. Which doesn't make the run in and of itself better, but it just makes my life easier. <laughs> Less sitting around and waiting. So this is the first boss fight. This is Tiny Tiger, the third boss from Crash 2. And the cool thing about a lot of the bosses in Crash 3 is that they've got 
nice little exploits in them that make them much easier or much quicker or both. And Tiny is one of them, and this is actually an exploit they carried over from the original Crash 3 as an Easter egg. So Tiny's gonna jump at me, and I just have to dodge his hit, his jumps, wait for him to get stuck in the ground, and then spin him. And then if I run in this top left corner right here, uh, the lions he's about to release actually can't hit me. And this was a glitch in the original game that they carried over as an easter egg, and the reason they're throwing cheese at me for being in that corner is because I'm cheesing out the fight. So it's a nice little nod to speedrunners. And I'm going to do it again. and bounce on Tiny. So what that did by bouncing on Tiny is that actually I skipped the animation where Crash does, after beating a boss, he always does the spinning into the double P sign. If you bounce on Tiny when that animation is supposed to happen, you actually skip it. So and that was discovered by Roach, the current world record holder of Crash 3 percent So because I have a mask, the next level I'm going to enter is Midnight Run. This is another tiger level. And I want I want a mask in this level just because some of the boxes are in the air. And if you hit them from the bottom, they can push you down right into an enemy. And I don't want to take damage. Or I don't want to die if that happens, so I'd rather just take the damage from the mask. And the level I'm entering after this, I won't need the mask anyway, so... And this level is a lot more densely compact than Orient Express. There's a lot more enemies that get in your way. Overall, it's not a terrible level, though. It's just having Mask is good coverage. So that worked out really well. The next level I'm going to enter is Hog Ride. It is a motorcycle racing level, and I have to play as Crash for it, so I'm going to switch back to him. And the way these levels work is that you have to win the race to get the crystal. They're not that bad, but it's a very big time loss if you mess up the race. So. And you can get a little speed boost at the beginning if you hold acceleration at the second light. The most annoying part of this is trying to weave around these racers. Is there a category for Trilogy 315%? Well, it's not 315%, it's 312% because Crash 2 only goes up to 102%, but yes, there is a category for that. Uh, it's also an extremely long category, so like nobody's actually has a run for it. And I went down again, cool. That's annoying, that's bad.
So yeah, wait for that coming back up. But yeah, it's very annoying to weave through the weave through the cars and use the turbo boost. So So next level I'll be entering is G Wiz. So I don't actually need Coco for the rest of this warp room, however I will be switching to her for it, simply because there is an extremely minor time save in Tomb Time if you play as Coco, and it's only in an instance where you make a mistake, but... Coco f doesn't have... I want that mask. Coco, for whatever reason, doesn't have every animation that Crash does. As a result, sometimes in a situation where Crash would have a death animation or a damage animation, Coco doesn't. So she gets out of it quicker because she just has the standard damage or death animation. In the case of level 9, there are obstacles that can crush you. And... If Crash gets crushed, you're stuck in this long, like, five-second animation where he waddles around flattened and then picks himself back up. If you get crushed as Coco, she just keeps going. So, on the off chance that I mess up, that'll save time. So I don't want invincibility in this level, so I'm just gonna... Oh. You know what? I'm just gonna... Go back and grab that. <laughs> I don't want invincibility in this level, but I do want it in the next two levels, so... Then next level will be hang 'em high. This level is similar to hanging out in Crash 2, where it's very beneficial to have invincibility for the hang rails. However, that first guy right there is going to do everything his power to not let me have it. Thankfully, I didn't let him do that. So. so, yeah. I didn't show this off in Crash 2 because I used a different strat in hanging out, but essentially the invincibility makes you move much faster on these hang rails. Have I tried 312%? Uh, no. <laughs> um, that would take a considerable chunk of time out of my day, because 312% would be... What the heck? Let's see if I can do some math here. 312% would be... an. Eight, like an 8 hour run at best and I would say it would probably be closer to a 9 to 10 hour run or if I'm really unlucky like a 12 hour run so that would take up half a day and I just don't have time for that and it would be extremely draining and I haven't even done Crash 3 105% yet Chris is doing it soon more power to him J Hobbs did a, one, a 3 12% run but he didn't feel like removing the times, so I didn't feel like accepting it because we require a load those times as well. Hey Ken, 246. I'm assuming this is for 105%. Good job, man. I told you my 105 run was mediocre. For Crash 1. I don't even remember what oh right 
My PB was like 314, but I also had like significantly less load times. But still, you you trounced my run, so good job, man. Also, for everybody who just came in from Kane's run, you came in at a good time. I'm commentating this full trilogy run because I'm going to use it for an EGDQ submission. Because this has been very solid. And I actually, I even got a PB in Crash 2, any percent, which means I broke the world record again. Uh, <laughs> Trying to dodge that fire. Oh, I messed that up. Whoops. The Cobras have kind of annoying hitboxes. Thank you for the GZ. If you hadn't lost four minutes in Stormy Ascent, you would have subbed my load this time. Epic. <laughs> I don't even remember where I lost like most of my time in my 105 playthrough for Crash 1. Like that probably all over the place. Do I still run OG Trilogy? I'm mostly doing Insane Trilogy right now. I have gone back to Crash 2 no-go a couple times. But I mostly haven't been touching Crash 1 or Crash 3. Actually, I haven't tried... Yeah. I've touched Crash 1 and Crash 3 for races, and I didn't even finish the Crash 1 race. And then Crash 2, I've been mostly doing no-go. I attempted Hundo, and I couldn't get through it either. So this is Dingo Dial. This is a super exploitable fight because you can just glitch high jump over these crystals. Which also was in the original game. And because they kept glitch high jump, they, they kept this trick. But Dingo Dial ha does have some invincibility frames that I, ha that I have to be wary of. And sometimes he starts firing before you can actually hit him again. Thank you for the good luck, gaming expert. So thankfully this time Dingo Dial didn't start firing preemptively. That fight's really trivial because of the glitch high jump. Break out the butter. We're gonna make toast. Oh, the portal's gotta be all the way over there, doesn't it? Alright, so unfortunately I took a hit in Tomb Time, so I'm not gonna enter level 11 Dynamite just yet, because I want to have two masks in that level. So instead, we'll be entering level 12 Deep Trouble as another underwater level. I'll be using some damage abuse in this level. Wow. Yeah, he doesn't say you thrashed him anymore. It is disappointing. In the old game, if you beat Dingo Dial, he'd go, You thrashed me, mate. No worries. But he says nothing now, and it's kind of sad. Uh, go down. This mech right here can be very annoying. If you do the turbo boost with it, and then you don't let go of your direction, you actually locked into not moving. <laughs> it's kind of annoying. Oh no, I got stuck. I got stuck. That's bad. Okay, this is level is going wonderful. I don't need that checkpoint I just skipped. That would be really bad. Of course! I say I hope I don't need that checkpoint and then I needed it. So that's a pretty major time loss. That's kind of bad. Let's try this again. Level can go very right or very wrong sometimes. This is a case where it's going very wrong. 
Oh man, it's really going wrong. Holy cow. I almost died there too. Oh man, those fish are being very annoying. Yeah, this mech is really annoying to deal with sometimes. We're gonna use it here to get a damage abuse. Oh boy. That was not a very pretty deep trouble, I must admit. So this is the second race level in my opinion, in the opinion of many, that's the most annoying race level. Just because it's a very long one, and a couple mis mistakes can cost you the race. I've actually grown quite used to Road Crash though. Uh, the motorcycle in Insane Trilogy turns a little tighter than it does in the original game, so a lot of these curves are much easier to get. And this applies to the jet ski also. The jet ski turns much tighter than it did in the original game. So I didn't want to hit him, I wanted to get around him. That could be a little annoying. Oh yeah, he's just being that guy. Here's a cool little thing. I believe it's this one. Yeah. So this turn onto this turbo pad actually wasn't possible in the original game. At least as far as I know, it's not possible. I believe there was a TAS run where the TASR couldn't even get that turn. But the, the bike turns tight enough in the Insane Trilogy where you can get it quite easily. The only motorcycle level you have trouble with is Area 51. Yeah, Area 51 is a really tricky one. You have to know it, but thankfully Area 51 is a secret level, so you don't have to do it in any percent. So in any percent, Road Crash is the hardest one. In 105, I would say, yeah, Area 51 is probably the hardest one. But I also don't think it's as difficult as everybody makes it out to be. It's a hard level for sure, but it's not, like, backbreaking difficult. Alright. The next level is High Time. This level is, it's got some tricky jumps and it'll be the first use of me using the double jump power up. And I guess I didn't really explain power ups. In Crash 3, every time you beat a boss, you get a special power up. The power up from Tiny is useless. It's a super body slam, which just enhances the regular body slam, which we don't use anyway, so there's no point. But Dingo Dial gives us a double jump and it's pretty useful in a lot of places, like there. In here. I want to keep this mask. Oh. Let's try that again.
donation incentive to let the now you're on my time cutscene play. Uh, that doesn't sound like a good donation incentive. Although I do like the idea of a donation bid war between playing as Crash or playing as Coco, or for Crash 1, a donation incentive of doing Stormy Ascent after the run. Alright, so the next level is double header. This is the last uh, medieval level, and it's named after the two headed giants that are in it. You also get speed shoes in Crash 2. Yeah, you do get speed shoes in Crash 2. So, G Wiz and Double Header both let you si slide along the side here, which lets you dodge a lot of. Holes. Whew, that one was a little close for comfort though, I almost fell into the hole. I honestly question how useful the speed shoes would be in Crash 1, just because it's a lot of waiting for cycles. So, there's a lot more jumping across platforms in Crash 1 than there are in 2 and 3. So as a result, the speed shoes wouldn't be as useful. And they might actually be either game-breaking or too powerful and not useful. Like you would jump too far. So I can understand why they didn't do the speed shoes in Crash 1. The game is overall much more simplistic in its design, so the speed shoes don't fit well in it. Whereas in Crash 2, the speed shoes do fit well for time trials because the level design in 2 is somewhat similar to the level design in Crash 3 in terms of platformers. Yeah, speed shoes would be very game breaking for 1, so it makes sense that you can't get them in Crash 1, honestly. Alright, so I managed to leave that level with 2 masks, which means I'll have the invincibility at the beginning of Dynamite. They'd be useful in the early levels of 1, but then they'd be broken everywhere else, so it's not really worth it, honestly. The early levels of 1 are really the only ones where, like, it's running and not a lot of, uh, jumping, because a lot of the later levels do constant jumping. Like, 1's level design is just very different. So this invincibility lets me... Not only you slide over this lava, it also lets me slide through these fish. When the fish are spinning, you can't hurt them, but if you're invincible, you can just run through them anyway. Can't run through that one, though. So this egg gives us a baby dinosaur to ride on. Uh, unfortunately, he's actually slower than Crash's slide spin. Not by much, but he is, so... He's sadly not worth going for. That was slower, but it was safer, so... I especially I want to keep at least one mask going into the next boss fight. Oh, that was unfortunate. For any percent you personally prefer using individual level splits, and that's what I did. It depends on the run for me. For Crash 1 and Crash 2, I do individual level splits because the path is pretty set in stone. For Crash 3, it varies depending on how many masks I have, so I do boss splits. Like, Crash 3's level order varies greatly compared to Crash 1 and Crash 2. Alright, so this is Entropy. He has a really cool exploit. Uh, you can skip all three of his phases using the glitch high jump and the double jump. 
However, the last phase to get consistently requires a damage abuse, which is why I needed the mask, and hopefully I don't mess it up. If I do, it'll be rather unfortunate. So in the original game, if you tried to do that, he would automatically kill you, which he still does with that ring that was that sphere that was around him. But you can stay out of the range of it. All right. So this last one is where I'm going to need the damage abuse because the the jump doesn't reach far enough. Wow! I went right over it. Never mind. Well, I did it wrong. So bye bye time. That one's a little tr that one's a little annoying. But essentially, I would have supposed to damage abuse off of that second. That over that second one. All right, so I'm gonna have to do this phase normally. Which kind of sucks, but yeah, happens sometimes. The rest of this run has been solid, so, you know, I'll take one major mistake. Oh, that's not a cool formation. Yeah, that's, that really sucked, honestly. Um, oh well. I'll make up for it with the rest of the run. Calm down with the bad puns, gaming expert, please. However, beating Entropy gives us a really awesome movement tech. So you'll be seeing much more of that later. So beating Entropy gives you the Death Tornado Spin, which is if you tap the spin button repeatedly, you'll be able to spin for much longer. And it also gives you the ability to glide through the air. However, a side effect of it that was discovered by a time trialer whose YouTube username is Abdul the Arabic guy is if you do a slide spin into a death tornado spin and then you do a really tiny hop, when you land from the death tornado spin, you will get a huge momentum boost for as long as the spin is active. So... From this point on, in most of the platformer levels, we'll be making use of this tech. There are six platformer levels left, and it's useful in, I would argue, five of them. There's only one where it really just doesn't come up at any point. Um, the movement tech has a bunch of different names. The most common three are... there's The first one is called Abduling, which is named after the guy who found it, Abdul. Uh, I'm not the biggest fan of this name, to be honest, because I don't think it describes what the move does. Uh, another very common name is Turbo Tornado or Turbo Nado, because that does explain what it does. It's a Turbo Tornado Spin. Uh, my personal favorite, and this is one that I coined myself, and it's been picked up by uh, several other runners, uh, namely Roach, J Hobbs, I think Spike Vegeta calls it this, uh, just a bunch of others that I just can't remember off the top of my head. And it's called, uh, the name I came for up with it for it is the Mock Tornado, which also incidentally describes what it does. It's just a huge speed boost off of a tornado spin, and it's also a nice nod to the Kirby series in the form of Meta Knight. So, I call it Mock Tornado just because I really like that name, but it has a bunch of names. So this crystal is the single most annoying one in the Insane Trilogy, and somehow it went really well for me. But that bomb sh like stands right in front of that crystal, and you usually have to like weave around it in a really annoying fashion. Somehow I got it really quickly. Oh, that, that got stuck. Yeah, Chris calls it the Mock Tornado, because that's what Roach told him it was called. If I remember correctly though, Chris doesn't use the Mock Tornado, and I would highly recommend that he learn it. It's a very useful technique. It saves a quite a bit of time when done correctly.
And it's not part it's not a particularly difficult technique to do once you know how it works. So this level Sphinx in air. The invincibility would have been nice in this level, but it's not useful. It's not it's not that it's not useful, it is useful. It's not vital. So I'm gonna there's one mask in this level. I'm gonna hopefully use it to get out of uh, this level with two masks. Unfortunately, sometimes you get stuck in a glide when you mock tornado. Oh wow, I dropped the spin. That really sucks. That wasn't the input dropping though, I just spun too slowly. So I won't be leaving this level with two masks. The only level where it's like super vital to have two masks is Future Frenzy, because it lets you use the Mock Tornado a lot more. It's very useful in Tomb Raider, but it's not as vital as Future Frenzy, in my opinion. So I gotta do everything in my power to keep this mask and the mask in Tomb Raider. when you miss the button that opens the door. That was a little... That was a very shoddy Sphinxinator, honestly. So I'll be going into Tomb Waiter next. I will be losing a bit of time in this level just because invincibility in Tomb Waiter... The gimmick of Tomb Waiter is that there's rising and falling water and you have to wait for it to go back down before you can pass. And having invincibility in Tomb Waiter stops the water from rising. Mock Tornado in particular is really useful on like slopes or like elevated platforms because it's a lot easier to land out of the short hop. Yeah, this water can be very scary. So those holes are kind of botched up and sometimes they kill you even when you're not in them. It's a little scary with no masks. Rhythm is also very important in you doing the Mock Tornado because if you just button mash as fast as you can, the spin doesn't last as long, so you want to go for like a rhythmic tap. It makes the spin not end sooner. 
Short Hop Mock Tornado, yep. That's my favorite advanced tech. In Crash 3 and in Super Smash Bros. Brawl. Alright, so next level is Future Frenzy, and thankfully I have two masks going into this. Hello, Marlin. Thank you, Earl. Not my best Tomb Waiter, but for a maskless run, it was pretty alright. So Mock Tornado is really useful at the beginning of Future Frenzy. And assuming that I get through this without taking a hit, it'll be useful in the middle portion when I have invincibility as well. I botched up the cycles there a little bit, so I just used Death Runner Spin to get around those lasers. Alright. So I can use Mock Tornado in a lot of spots I wouldn't have normally been able to just because I can get ar around a lot of these enemies. lost it there. That's alright. I'm gonna lose both of my masks after this level anyway, because the next level is a plain level and they take your mask from you. Death Tornado Spin makes a lot of these levels really fun because you're just flying over a bunch of obstacles. Alright, last level in the run is Bye Bye Blimps. So, this is a plane level. The goal is to shoot down the seven blimps in the level. And much like the jetpack, I'm going to invert my controls in the menu because that's how they are in the original and I don't feel like learning and unlearning. So there's a bit of a pattern to this. I start with the one to the right. And then the one on the left. And then this one. Plane levels, I feel, are much better in the Insane Trilogy, as opposed to in the original trilogy. At least I prefer them much more. I feel like the bullets actually do stuff. And they feel like they go by much quicker as well. This barrel roll or dodge spin or whatever I'm doing lets me avoid getting hit. Pretty quick level. So the reason I played this entire warp room is Coco is not only that were there two Coco levels in here anyway, but the fourth boss fight with Engine is a Coco exclusive boss fight, so it was just beneficial to play as her anyway. So much like the Brio fight in Crash 1, this is a two-phase boss fight. Um, the first phase has five hits, much like the fight in Crash 2, but you're fighting him in a giant spaceship in space. And then after the first phase, you go into a second phase that has seven hit points. So ideally aim for the center first to destroy it, and then go for the two shoulders whenever they're open. And then whenever he raises his arm, destroy it as quickly as possible.
That was a decent first phase. The shoulders, I think, could have been a little better. Alright. Oh, I took quite a bit of damage from that. So that very slow moving bomb I just destroyed takes like 20% or something out of your health. It can be very annoying. And then I just have to get rid of these rocket launchers and then we're good. Engine moves much less in this phase than he did in the original. Like in the original he's like flying all over the place, which makes this phase go by much quicker. And we're good. I mean, it's not exactly optimal, I feel, to take no damage in the engine fight because sometimes you just want to take a straight hit to destroy the pieces faster. Alright, so we'll be entering warp 5 now, and I'll, we'll be doing most of this with Coco, but towards the end we're going to have to switch back to Crash. So this is the second plane level, this is Mad Bombers. So curiously enough, Bye Bye Blimps can only be done as Coco, but Mad Bombers you can play as Crash or Coco. This one also has a pattern, but the planes moving makes things a little more finicky. But thankfully they go down much quicker than they did in the original game. This is honestly one of my least favorite levels in the original Crash 3, but it's not bad at all in this version, honestly. They added a third plane that you don't like. I'm assuming you mean the planes that try to shoot at you. I mean, they did add it, but the planes also don't do as much damage and they're also not as good at hitting you. Hey, Crisco, how are you? Alright. So the next level is Bug Light. And much like uh, Tomb Time, it's beneficial to have Coco in this level solely because her damage animation for being crushed is way quicker than crashes and if I go fast enough with mock tornadoes there will actually be a section where I want to damage abuse through a door so it's a bit tight to get though so if I mess up the mock tornado anywhere I'll likely miss it anyway and it's a, it's a couple seconds of time lost if I miss it but it's not the end of the world Got it. So yeah, if I had done that with Crash, he would have like flattened and then like stayed flattened for a few seconds and then like unflattened. Yep, I got caught in the glide there. Again, got caught in the glide. This was a very uneventful invincibility, to be honest. Oh my god. That was a really stupid hit. Unfortunately, that's gonna slow down Gone Tomorrow. It's gonna remove a lot of the Mock Tornado potential in Gone Tomorrow, because I use invincibility a lot in that one, too. Or I can just have no invincibility whatsoever. That's okay, too. 
or no masks whatsoever. Okay, there's one mask left in this run. It's in level 21, which I'll be entering next, but unfortunately there will be no invincibility. So you're able to play as Coco in these levels because Cra the Insane Trilogy added a feature where you can play as Coco in all three games in any level that is not a vehicle level exclusive to Crash. Or a boss fight that's exclusive to Crash. So every, almost every platforming level you can play as Coco. And in Crash 3, it's beneficial to play her alongside Crash just to make some animations quicker. So if I had invincibility, I'd be using Mock Tornado here, but alas. Plus, Coco is cute. I agree. I do like Coco. She's a very cool character. That's one of the things I really like about Crash 3 speedruns in NST is that you use her quite a bit. So if I'm lucky, I might be able to get it in the mock tornado here. Or I can just mess it up, never mind. <laughs> okay, sure. <laughs> Those hitboxes are kind of annoying. This is sloppy. I think adding Coco was an amazing idea for a number of reasons. She was already a fan favorite character, and then she's a female character play as, which attracts female gamers. Which in an industry that is predominantly male dominated, that's a very good selling point. And on the subject of Toad and Peach as playable characters, Peach in Super Mario 3D World is lit. She is my favorite character in that game. And uh, apparently, from what I've read up on in Super Mario 3D World speedruns, she's also the best character, so that makes me very interested. Crash. So this is Flaming Passion. This level is infamous for killing a lot of runs. It is extremely tricky platforming. There are no masks in it whatsoever. Coco sells more to male gamers than female IMO. That, that is also a fair point, but... I don't know. She's just a good selling point regardless. So they made those fires a lot easier to jump over in the Unsane Trilogy, which makes a lot of these jumps a lot less scary, but still scary. Wow, okay. <laughs> Apparently I didn't spin. What probably happened was that this cooldown between spins is about like a half second to second interval where you can't spin after a spin. And that's probably what hit me. Yeah. I've had worse flaming passions to be honest. That was probably the best place I could have died. 
All right, so we have one more race level and then the final boss and then we're good. So I'll be playing as Crash from this point on because you can only play as Crash in racing levels and then the final boss requires Crash as well. So bye-bye, Coco, unfortunately. So this is Orange Asphalt. It is the last race level. In my opinion, it is much easier than Road Crash, and I would argue it might even be easier than Hog Ride. So, you can make a lot of mistakes in this level and still win the race. In fact, I do make a lot of mistakes in this level and I still <laughs> I still win the race. So, this one's very lenient. I drop stream again, yay. I need to change servers or something. Oh, I didn't drop stream, I just dropped frames, that's fine. <laughs> that's much better. Oh, wow, that guy was very nice and moved around for me. There's still quite a lot of race left and I'm already in second place, so that is a testament to how many errors you can make in this level and still win the race. I don't know if my stream dropping is a problem with the Twitch servers or if it's a problem with my internet, but it's been happening a lot. It wasn't doing it for the past few days, but today is like the most it's done it in a while, so I don't know, man. I think from a speedrunning perspective, hog ride is harder because it is much harder to weave and hold the boost in that level and a single one or two mistakes in that level, keeping the hog, hog ride boost for as long as you can hold it, which is literally the entire level, is very difficult. Like I can't even do that. So yeah. Orange Asphalt is the most forgiving of the three by far, which is why I think it's the easiest one. So this is the final boss. This is Cortex again. Shocker, Cortex is the final boss in every single Crash game. Well, of the original trilogy. He's not the not every single Crash game. But yeah. So, yeah. So the way this fight works is that Cortex is going to fire ray beams at you again. And you have to dodge them and wait for his shield to drop. Meanwhile, Aku Aku and Uka Uka are going to duke it out. Uka Uka, who I failed to mention as a character, is Aku Aku's evil twin. <laughs> um, so they're going to fight. And this whole time you have to not get hit by any of them. And then strike Cortex when he's down. He likes to throw these minas at you. And sometimes he likes to lob them halfway across the screen like he just did. I don't like when he does that. <laughs> Ripto is a crash boss. That is very true. Ripto is a crash boss. <laughs> he is a boss in Crash Purple. <laughs> so real talk, I actually don't think Crash Purple is that bad. I don't think it's good, but I don't think it's terrible. It's mediocre. That tornado moves very slowly and makes it kind of hard to avoid. Yep, he lobbed that one too. And unfortunately that was an annoying formation. There we go. Cortex technically it shares final boss with Ripto and Crash Purple because the final like the secret section that you get for having every gem the final fight is Ripto and Cortex at the same time. Yeah. 
Yeah, the tornado moves much slower than it does in the original game, which makes it much harder to maneuver around, which I don't mind as a change. I like that they made the fight challenging. This is a really annoying formation. There we go. So grab the speed shoes and the run ends when I enter the portal. And we're done. 317-19. So that was overall a really solid trilogy run. And that also is the world record by about 7 minutes. Which is pretty cool. And I got world record in Crash 2 any percent in the middle of that run, which was awesome. So overall, that went really, really well. So, yeah. So, yeah. I will use this as an AGDQ submission video because that run went really well. So, yeah. That was Crash Bandicoot and Sane Trilogy. Full Trilogy, any percent. And I hope that everybody at AGDQ can considers this game for a run, whether it be a single game's any percent or all three any percents or whatever it is. I think it deserves a showing at AGDQ. It's shown a good amount of development in the short time it's been out. It's only been out for about two months, and it's got a pretty decent scene going, which I think is very promising for the future. So, yep, I hope you all consider this, and thank you for watching.